Well, hello everybody, and welcome to our annual Top BI Trends for 2016, for the next year, of course. As in every year, uh, towards the end of the year, we assemble uh, the best minds in Panorama, and we talk to our uh, most innovative customers and partners to see what are the top trends for next year, so we can address them. And, of course, what I'm going to show you are the top trends we have found in the market that we expect will lead the market, uh, the BI market in 2016, and things you should think about, things that uh, you should start addressing in the way you uh, address your BI projects. So, my name is Tomer Paz. I'm the product manager here at Panorama, and I'll be presenting to you what is what the future of your BI uh, world is going to be like. Before going in, directly into the BI predictions, let's take a look at the general technology market and what are the things that uh, will lead the general technology market in 2016. So I've gone and looked at what are the different predictions that are made and some of the interesting things here is an example that comes out of Gartner they published this uh, a few weeks ago and I really would encourage you to go and look for they have a really nice video that uh, shows uh, all of these predictions so I really would encourage you go and look for this video uh, just to go through what are the things they see the most uh, important predictions for 2016. They revolve around three areas, digital mesh, smart machines, and uh, the new IT reality. D digital mesh has to do with new devices that and how they will be uh, taking over uh, the different uh, attributes of the digital world. So there is device mesh, which we're going to talk about as well. Uh, we'd have to do with new devices around what we refer to today as mobile. Ambient user experience, which is really uh, what is known today as augmented reality. And 3D printing, which I'm sure you, you all know already. Then there are the smart machines. Smart machines are machines that enable to... Um, emit information about what's going on within them. Uh, for example, if you have a production machine, it can give more and more information that then you may use. And of course, we're going to talk about that later on. Machine learning, the ability of a machine to learn how to do its job better according to the successfulness rate of what it did before and autonomous agents and things. So machines that come to conclusions on their own, maybe interact one with each other to be able to continue and work and do a better job. And in order to support that, there is a new IT reality. Uh, there is a new reality for adaptive security architecture. Because we now have more and more uh, nodes in the architecture that are intelligent nodes that uh, that have a variety of architectures we need to have <coughs> sorry we need to have a new security uh, mechanisms to, to handle this uh, to address uh, rapid response to hacker attacks for example a new system architecture that enable us to, to merge all these new types of machines and new methodologies. We need to mesh apps and services to this architecture and of course the Internet of Things. So be able to uh, address the new reality of the amount of data and new reality of platforms that are available to address that. So this is really, I'm just, I, I sped through it really interesting interesting predictions and I suggest you find the original uh, documents and video that go more deeply into it if you go into our world 
you can see that uh, this is something that Gardner published just recently. And they predict, according to uh, what they, the questionnaires that they gave to CIOs, that BI will be at the top priorities of CIOs in 2016. Now, is this surprising? It is not surprising at all. The reason it is not surprising because BI was at the top uh, priorities of CIOs for the last I don't know how many years. This is just, it's becoming, it was always important and it's becoming more and more critical in the work of, uh, of CIOs because information and the ability to derive uh, insights and to uh, create, uh, to make decisions according to this are becoming more and more important uh, for CIOs and for organizations in general. And when we go through our predictions for what will drive BI in 2016, you're going to see that uh, we believe that these things are what ma will make BI so important for, the for CIOs in 2016. Now, with that in mind, let's take a look at what we believe are the top 10 uh, drivers for BI that in 2016. So are you ready? I'm ready. So let's start. Number 10, the fading of centralized on-premise data warehouse. So for I don't know how many years, for it seems like eternity, the data warehouse was the most important thing in business intelligence. So first you had to assemble all your data in your data warehouse and then start running reports, building dashboards on top of this data warehouse. But as they say in the, in the Game of Thrones, all men must die, so all concepts must evolve. Uh, this data warehouse, the centralized on-premise data warehouse, is, uh, is reaching its, li its limits now and we're going to see it's fading away, being replaced by something else. And we'll talk about what's that something else later on. So why is it that it doesn't cut it anymore? First of all, it isn't agile. It doesn't uh, support the ability for rapid changes in the types of data, in the sizes of data, in the, the construction of the data. It's, the, it's based on very stable processes and data inputs. It's not scalable. So we all know there's more and more and more and more data and we just don't have that data available. Uh, we just don't have the, the data warehouse isn't available to put all this data inside it. It's very pricey. So it's pricey to buy, it's pricey to set up, and it's pricey to automate, to operate. It doesn't have any automation in it. You need to have the people in place to operate it, to um, to build the data, to uh, cleanse the data, to merge the data. There's no automation, and we'll talk about it later on. But without automation, you just can't handle all the data. And when it comes to different data types. The basic concept of what we need to do is let's make it into a table and then we can add it to the data warehouse. Well, we have more and more and more uh, types of data that are not table oriented. And if we want something that will work for us for future types of data, it needs to be something that serves our purposes and not something that we need to make everything fit it. So it needs to be something that continuously is able to add data sources of a variety of types that the data sizes grow and change, sometimes even get reduced. Can't be static. Pricing has to be tied to usage and benefits it gives the organization. It has to be supported by automated uh, capabilities. We'll talk about it later on. It's the big deal. And without it, it just it won't cut it. And it needs to support a versatile types of data. 
and the on-premise on data warehouses that we have today just don't cut it. So it will be replaced by something else. Uh, and we'll talk more about what these things can be later on. So let's move to number nine. Hadoop accelerators are the last chance for Hadoop. So that sounds like I'm talking about the demise of Hadoop, and it's not really that. But if Hadoop was what everybody was talking about uh, a year ago and two years ago, it's running. In, we were seeing it running into hurdles. So Hadoop was seen by many as as how uh, data should be handled. It was seen as the thing to replace uh, the old data warehouse, addressing the four V's of big data, the velocity, uh, the volume, uh, the variety, and veracity. And it ha to be honest, it has all that. Uh, it, it was accepted as a standard by many people. And in the last 10 years, it gained a lot of traction, especially in the last three years. But the more that it was put into use, the more that uh, we've seen issues with it. It is too complex to assemble. It's built out of different components. And in order to handle it, you need people who specialize in it, who can uh, massage it to the, to the organization needs. And it's, it's tough. It's tough to manage. It's also too slow for analytics. And as somebody who is working in a BI company, you can understand that we're very sensitive to this. If you want to, uh, to do analytics on it, sometimes the amount of time you need to wait for a response from Hadoop is just too, too much. It's far, far too much to be able to be supported. And because of it, it has to use another types of products called search-based indexes for search and classification. So again, it's another component, another product you need to add on top of it just to make it usable. So we're seeing two types of solutions to solve these the pains that Hadoop is giving. The first are Hadoop accelerators. Uh, there are different types of Hadoop accelerators that sometimes even go a step further and try to replace Hadoop. Uh, that uh, run other processes on top of it to make it faster and easier to manage. There are also other types of products uh, called uh, that are based based their solution on top of Hadoop on search methodologies that make the the ability to fetch data from Hadoop faster. The other types of uh, options are. Either, either new generation of Hadoop or other types of NoSQL databases or other types of uh, databases that are faster, that are more tailored to their uh, end users and the, their needs. And you can see there are two schools of thought here. One tries to make Hadoop better. The other says, no, we have to move beyond Hadoop. I don't know who will win, but one of these We'll, ha we'll have to win whether it's on top of Hadoop or replacing Hadoop. Let's move to number eight. The Internet of Things. I'll let you read the slide for a second. Now, of course, the Internet of Things is, goes a lot beyond what the refrigerator and stove can, can give you or how they operate. Uh, and we see a great acceleration with the Internet of Things. More data sources, more types of data sources that generate more and more data, and there is more software around to take advantage of all these data. Uh, organizations are trying to utilize this data to gain their competitive advantage. So there's uh, they, they equate more data means better analysis. And to be honest, it's not entirely true because sometimes if you just gather more and more data, you don't do much with it. But uh, generally, I would agree that the more data you have, the more ability uh, you have to utilize this data. And you have to take the next step and you utilize this data. 
in order to to un un better understand uh, the reality of your business and the opportunities that you may have. Adding external data sources is also critical because it uh, it gives you information that validates what you're saying or this validates what you're saying and gives you more insight into your reality. But, and this is something that a lot of uh, organizations are struggling with, you need to monetize the data. Just collecting it doesn't, doesn't cut it. You need to be able to get this information and, may, and tie it into the organizational processes and needs. So what are the implications that you should take, care, you should take notice of? First of all, don't focus only on collection. Actually, don't focus on collection. Focus on analysis. After you understand what it is like to analyze big data information, then you can improve your collection uh, abilities, store more data, and understand what it means to model it and analyze it. If you focus on collection, you're just collecting virtual dust. Secondly, there's a new industry emerging, which is called the M2M industry, machine to machine. It's been talked about a long time, but now we're starting to see the beginning of the reality of M2M. So what is M2M? Take, take for example, my car. My car can, can uh, transmit a lot of data. So let's say my car can uh, give out information about how much fuel I have in my tank. And it, it can transmit it to my schedule. My schedule program will look at it, see when I need to get up in the morning, and if I don't have enough fuel, will set the alarm clock 10 minutes earlier, so I wake up in time uh, to be able to fuel up and still get to work in time. There was no person in the process here. My car is a machine, my scheduler is a machine, my alarm clock is a machine, and together they decided to wake me up 10 minutes earlier. Now, if you think this is futuristic, well, you're wrong, because all these things are available. Uh, cars that transmit information, of course we have that already. Schedules that can uh, make a decision based on inputs from different sources, of course it's available. An alarm clock that can change the alarm time according to some external trigger, of course it's available. It's just a matter of tuning everything together to give me the experience of not setting up the alarm clock, having it decide when should I wake up. I know some of you think it's a horror story and not an advantage, but just think of what it means to your business as well. Uh, and cloud deployments are becoming uh, more and more important for the Internet of Things. Why? Because internally, we do not have all the tools that are needed to support the scalability and the applicability of uh, tools to the Internet of Things type of data. So if you're not addressing it, uh, addressing how you handle Internet of Things in your organization, you need to start thinking about it and what implications it has to your business. Next, number seven, automated data integration. This is a big thing. It will become much bigger. The Internet of Things is accelerating, and with that, you get more data sources, more data, but you need to be able to handle all of this. So you get more information from your customers. You get more data from your operations. You have regulatory requirements about uh, getting information and sending out information. And in order to be able to make insights out of it, you need to blend all this data together. So. Continuing, continuing my car example, let's take it a notch. Uh, let's take it up a notch. So my car transmitted information about the fuel level. Traffic information is available. You all know the tools that, ge that generate traffic information. 
weather information is also available information publicly. To that, I need to add my own, let's call them internal data sources. I know when my kids need to go to school. I know when I need to be at work for my meeting in the morning. And I know what's my wife's uh, schedule and when she needs to be at her uh, place of employment. And my refrigerator also knows whether I have enough milk so my kids have milk uh, for, to, eat, uh, to eat cereal for breakfast. So something needs to take all this uh, information, merge it together, let, know, let my alarm clock know when I need to get up in order to succeed in doing all these things I need to do, and generate the task list for me so when I wake up, I know what I need to, to start doing from the moment I wake up. Uh, and not try to figure out something there that something plus my alarm clock know already. Now again, you think this is something incredibly futuristic, but it really isn't because all these things are available. And I expect you're going to see these things as a natural, uh, uh, natural thing we use in the daily uh, activities very soon. And if you think that... Uh, that I'm just uh, imagining things, think about how you drive from place to place today. How much you use automated tools to let you know how to get to your to where you need to go, when you need to leave, etc. It's, it's, it's already there. So, if you think about all of these things, now you have to think what it means to your organization. How many people do you have to handle all this accelerating amounts of data. Are you hiring new people? Now, well, I'm sure the answer is no. You are expected to, to use your current people. But there is more data and more data types and more types of ETLs are needed. So automation is essential. Without automation, you won't be able to handle all the data. Without automation, there's no Internet of Things, there's no big data, there's no insights. You will not be able to derive value from all the types of uh, assets that you have already. So remember this, automation is becoming key. Let's move to number six, mobile. So here's what I have to say on mobile. There is no such thing. There are devices uh, that... Their location is not tethered anymore. It's technically, you can move them with them from place to place. So the thing that doesn't exist actually is a desktop. The desktop is just a device that sits on your desk, but you can take it with you. If you can't take it with you, then it's, a, it's an attribute of the device. So there's no mobile. There are devices that allow you to find what you need to, what you're looking for. And by the same account, there is no such thing as mobile BI. The same way, there is no such thing as a mobile spreadsheet or a mobile mail account. There's BI. And mobile BI just means that you're using an untethered device to do BI. What's the big deal? You're using untethered devices to do anything today. So that leads us to another unique and in my opinion, kind of strange uh, attribute of mobile devices, which is offline mode. It used to be a big deal, and it really isn't, because you're never offline. When are you offline? The data is always at your finger, uh, fingertips. You don't store the data on the device itself. That's, that's not realistic anymore. Nobody does that. So what is, when do you need offline? When, and the, uh, the two examples I hear all the time is when you're on a plane and when you're on a boat in the middle of the ocean. So forgive me for being s skeptical, but on the one hand, if it's really important to you, there's, there are ways to getting uh, connectivity also on an airplane and also when you're on a boat in the middle of the ocean. But uh, you're on an airplane usually for a few hours at the most, and if you're in the middle of the ocean on a boat, you probably don't want to get connectivity. So offline is really not a, 
not an issue except for those who want to make an issue out of it for sales reasons. Uh, the change in concept where you will have BI anywhere, anytime is actually disrupting the way you work. So it used to be that there's a report that is generated and then you use the report that is static, etc. But nobody works like that anymore. You want to know what's happening now and you don't want to see last month's report. Last month's report is old news. You want to see the report of now. So what we'll see in 2016 is we're going to see a diversified world of form factors. Whether it's watches or uh, tabletops or, uh, or glasses, and, uh, maybe there are things we don't even imagine yet, crystal balls, etc. Um, but all of them need to give you the services or in the BI services in the way you want to work. These are the new desktops. And what we're going to see is that solutions that are form factor specific are going to get integrated and assimilated to a form factor neutral devices that of course will use the form factor to give you better uh, presentation but will be part of a more generalized environment. Okay, let's move to number five. Number five is the cloud and Finally, we're seeing more and more cloud uh, in BI. And this is something I got, we got from IDC and why there is not cloud deployed yet. And you can see that the top two things are concerns about security and availability. And I can tell you that these concerns have to do with misperception of what cloud is. I, you can see that many people have that misconception. But still, it has to do with the customers and not with the offerings and vendors. And the next in line is we have not yet developed cloud roadmap identifying technologies to move to the cloud. So again, this has to do with the customers and not with the offerings and the vendors. Cloud is available and it's just a matter of how long it takes for customers to move to the cloud and the reasons they have to move or not move. So we believe that cloud will be the new normal. It takes time, but eventually we won't ask the question where it is because it's really not interesting where the data resides. The reason that BI is one of the last uh, markets to get into the cloud is because if the data is on-premise and is not uh, transferable to a cloud uh, solution, then there is no uh, there is no opportunity to put BI in the cloud, and only when the data is available in the cloud will BI in the cloud be relevant. Why is it good to put BI in the cloud? Well, I'll give you two main reasons. One is clear cost cutting, but that's relevant really mostly to small companies. In large companies, it's not. It's not a major driver, and the the chain the differences in costs are not that big. So the question is, who cares about the location? Who cares? Do you know where your servers are? If they're cloud servers or on premise, you don't, and you don't care. But to be honest, we believe that that kind of answer will fade because cloud gives you benefits that on premise doesn't, and that has to do with the vendors because the vendors can use. BI can utilize the cloudness of their solution to give you better services. For example, cross-corporate implementation. If you want to share something with your uh, with your customers, that's a core cross-corporate implementation. And suddenly, you want to give something that's behind the firewall to customers, to partners, and it's impossible to do. If it's in the cloud, it's much easier to do. Uh, social algorithms to automate processes where you benefit not from other people's uh, data, but from how they're using it to improve the automation of the tools will give cloud um, solutions much uh, deeper breadth. 
third party data and third party services are much better when they're in the cloud. So what are we going to see in 2016? First of all, we're going to see the emerging of unique solutions in the cloud. Rather than having the same solution be available on premise in the cloud, we're going to see a new type of BI in the cloud. And we're going to see new types of automation, both back-end automation of how you handle data as it comes in, and front-end automation of on how it's being presented and delivered. Let's move to number four. The data product exchange become, becomes democratized. Sorry. So here's the, 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 the problem. The problem is that when you have data coming into your organization, the IT needs to handle it, make sure it is stored somewhere. Then the DBA comes in and he has to put it in a database and make sure that it is cleansed. Then you have to have somebody who's doing the modeling. That takes time. And then the analyst needs to analyze the data and give the report to the business user. There are two main issues with uh, this whole process. It is very long. By the time the u business user sees what happened, it is a historical analysis rather than a current analysis and the business user is the real person who understands what the data means everybody in the middle are just the middlemen so the way to handle this is to use self-service for the business user by automating you've, you've heard me say automating before right automating suggestive bi where the data comes in and the business user and the way he uses the data will run the analysis, the modeling and handling of the data and the cleansing of the data. The IT people will deal with the strategic elements of the solution, not with the mundane day-to-day -day job. And this solution will become stronger and stronger as it's becoming more in the cloud, as I've explained before as it uses automated tools with a learning suggestive system and it's being used more because it does not require the user to, to, to be at his desktop to use it. Let's move to number three. The learning suggestive system. Artificial intelligence gets real. This is a very important part of what uh, I've just talked about before. The problem is that new data comes in, new types of data keep coming in, but if we, since we don't have the time, the people to cleanse it and prioritize it, the BI system needs to be the one to do that. So we need intelligent systems that learn and suggest what would be interesting for the user based on his operations, based on other people's operations based on collaborating and working on the data and based on analysis of the data and finding out which kind of data has interesting attributes. So for example, if we have something that's very static, it's not interesting. It might be important, but if it doesn't fluctuate, if there is no behavior for the data, then there is not much it's not much use, right? So only a system that's a learning suggestive system will allow users to automate the way they receive data and automate the insights they derive from it. Wow, I'm getting excited. We're down to the top two. So number two, the number two thing in BI in 2016, a visual language rules. So users are being thrown more and more data at, at them. Tables and charts and, 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 and files and it comes in different ways and different format. It's all very difficult to handle. And users need the to get only what's important and only using their own terms. 
So what we'll see is a new language for BI that is image-based. According to the images that the users are used to see, used to see in their line of business. Not numbers by numbers by numbers by numbers, because to be honest, most of the end users are don't really understand it. Technical people often find uh, uh, rows of numbers uh, as something acceptable, but business users less so. It needs to be live. It needs to be in real time, so it will reflect the actual situation, and needs to be dynamic. So let me give you a few examples of what uh, what we're talking about. Look at what you have on this slide. This is these are examples of what visual language of BI looks like. Everything is understood just by looking at it. You understand the context. You don't have to start reading uh, very technical definitions to understand what this is all about. Here's here are a few other examples. These are live examples from our customers and you can see makes working with data much easier, much better. And of course, from this, you can find out what you need to do and how to understand the, the data in a better ways. Let's move to number one. It's all about insights. Why? Because really, this is what you're looking for. You're looking for the insight, not the data. Users are not interested. If you have uh, hundreds of gigabytes of data, the, each of the elements is not interesting. What's interesting is the data, the insight that is derived from it. And users are usually baffled by the amount of data you give them or by KPIs which really don't do anything for them because everybody's using the same KPIs and they don't deliver competitive edge. Users need insights that are automatic, that give them suggestive analytics on reasons for the insights, that are predictive, that can tell them what will happen if they stay on course, whether it's good or bad, and dri that drive value to their work. And that is where will be the focus of BI in 2016. So here it is. The top 10 BI trends for, 2000, for 2016 by Panorama. So with this, I, I'd like to, to, to uh, answer some of your questions. You had really excellent questions here. So let me answer some uh, some of your questions uh, I'm not they're not prioritized so please forgive me um, I, I'm not going to answer questions about specific BI tools uh, I've, somebody have told me recently that good BI tools there are about 80 that they have identified in the market so there are lots of BI tools the question is which BI tools are relevant for you and fit what you need to do. Um, so there is a question here. BI is a tool, but real value add is evaluation of data and good recommendation for action. I agree with this wholeheartedly. Uh, the, the, the recommendation for action is what is important and not just the accumulation of data. Uh, a question of big about big data. Well, to be honest, almost everything I've touched upon here is big data. Uh, the reason we don't call it big data anymore because everything is big data. So it's all about the insight because we have so much data. Uh, visual language rules because we have so much data. Every, everything is, dry, is driven by the fact that we accumulate more and more data. Uh, for those of you who have asked more um, business-oriented questions, please contact us. Uh, directly via email. I'll give you my email in a second and we'll be happy to follow up with you. Um, do you think Microsoft tools such as SSRS, SSIS, and SSAS are becoming obsolete? Well, every tool is becoming obsolete eventually. So the question is how, do, how will they evolve? If they will evolve, 
what we believe according to these lines, then no. If they'll stay stagnant, then yes, and that is true for every tool in the market. There is a question about insight. How how do you how is insight uh, driven? So let me show you something. Uh, here's an example. This is a project we call Necto Insights that is in preview mode right now. Uh, and I'd like to show you how it uh, it looks like. So, for example, if I have an Excel here that uh, has lots of data, I want to find insights from it. So, I'll just upload my Excel. Here it is. And once I uploaded it, just one second, what it does now, it analyzes the data and you can see it gave me some insights here about profit and gave me different insights so I can move from insight to insight. Very easy, it can also give me forecasting information tell me what is forecasted from my data t for the next month. If you want to try it out, it's really easy. Just go to our website and you'll be able to try it out on your own. Uh, okay. So, thank you all for coming, uh, uh, for coming uh, to this webinar this morning. Uh, if you like to, if you have any more questions, like to discuss it with me, uh, here is my email address. Uh, I also encourage you to come to our website, uh, use Necto Insights, it's really easy, it's free, just try it on your own, uh, and read the other uh, BI industry blogs uh, then with analysis of the market that we have, and learn all about Necto, just come to our website and you'll be able to see all of this on your own. So, thank you very much, and hope to talk with you further about these interesting things.